This video is sponsored by Patience. When you want a dope reef tank, Patience is your greatest ally. There is a ubiquitous phenomenon in nature that, if not understood, holds many hobbyists back, especially newbies, from realizing their dream reef aquarium. Nobody really talks about it nor tries to define it. However, commonly heard pearls of wisdom like be patient, keep it simple, go slowly, or nothing good happens quickly in this hobby, all emerge because of this occurrence. The phenomenon is that when there is a significant change to the coral's environment, as long as it's not extreme, they will have a delayed visual response to change. It doesn't mean nothing is changing inside, rather it means we are probably not going to see it until later. It sounds simple I know, but you'll see that it has ramifications throughout the hobby. I postulate that it applies to dinoflagellates, and it likely gives rise to much of the conflicting information out there. It sheds light on why dips are unreliable, and it could explain those so-called random coral deaths. Your success in this hobby hinges on your understanding of this concept. One time, I took a frag from a seemingly healthy colony and placed that frag in another system. Months went by, and for some reason, one day the frag looked bad. I went over to look at the colony that has been in a totally different system for months, and sure enough, the colony also looked bad. And by the way, the remaining corals in both systems looked fine. At least three times in the last couple years, I bought frags from hobbyists, and they arrived looking pretty good. But as a little time went on, these frags did nothing and many eventually died. I couldn't figure out why. Come to find out months later, that the people who sold me these frags were now having issues in their tank. What this all means is that whatever caused those frags to look bad happened many months ago, prior to being separated, and it has taken months for the reaction to manifest in a way that we can see. This is probably what happens with mariculture and wild pieces. They may survive for a little bit, just enough time for someone to sell it, but unfortunately, many will eventually wither away and die. It could have been poor shipping conditions, or maybe they just prefer their natural habitat. Let's look at another common situation. Say you want to try this hot new magical supplement that your favorite Instagram reefer is endorsing. And because you've heard from gurus that you should make changes slowly, you are going to dose the product in the following way. I will illustrate it with this graph. On the x-axis is time, and each of these tick marks is a week. For the y-axis, this will represent dose of 5 milliliter increments. So to take it slow, you're going to start with dosing 5 milliliters for the first week and increase that 5 milliliters every week until you see the desired effect. Your dosing curve is essentially going to look like this. You stick to your plan and on the fourth week, you notice positive changes in a few corals. At this point, many would assume that the dosage at four weeks is the correct dose. But that's probably not correct, since corals tend to have a late visual manifestation to changes, the likely correct dose is much earlier. In fact, this is where it gets fuzzy, because the correct dose could be anything below 20 milliliters. And the problem is, is that different corals will respond differently, and they will have a different reaction time. But let's just pretend that we know that the minimum dosage to get these results is 10 milliliters. Well, Technically, you're already overdosing, and if you kept going with it, the excess would build up, especially if it's something that we can't test for. This always happens when I dose amino acids. I may see positive changes within the first week, but if I keep going with it, I will break out with bad algae and cyano. And this is just one change. Can you imagine the complication if you change two things? If after the third week you decided to start something else or alter your lighting spectrum, when things start changing, you can't know for sure if it's from the additives or because of the light spectrum. And because of this, you are likely to draw incorrect conclusions about the changes that you made. It's likely that erroneous conclusions like these are partly to blame for the mountains of conflicting information in the hobby. And this is why it's advisable to go slow, change one thing at a time, be patient, and keep it simple. Misinterpretation is also at the heart of the dinoflagellate problem. The common thinking is that low nutrients causes dinoflagellates. This, in my opinion, is the most preposterous statement in reefing. 
There are numerous scholarly articles supporting the fact that dinoflagellate growth is limited by nutrients. They need them. This is why you see your nutrients go to zero after you notice a dinoflagellate outbreak. But the reason that thousands of people think that low nutrients causes dinoflagellates is because reefers commonly measure zero nitrate and phosphate before seeing a dinoflagellate infestation. However, when you submit to this ubiquitous phenomenon that living things often have a delayed visual manifestation, you will realize that the most likely reason, the reason that actually makes sense, is that when you measure true zero nitrates and phosphates, dinoflagellates are already there multiplying. They have already taken hold of the system, driven the nutrients down, and even though you don't see them yet, a visual outbreak is imminent. Measuring zero nitrates and phosphates, especially in immature, unstable, or biologically disturbed systems, is a sign of impending doom. And what's funny is that since people have this fundamentally flawed belief that zero nutrients causes dinoflagellates, what do people do? They dose nitrate and phosphate, which just feeds the dinoflagellates even more. How many times have you heard someone say they measured zero nitrate and phosphate, so they tried dosing nutrients or feeding more, but the dinos appeared anyway? Instead of stressing the system by adding nitrates and phosphates, when you measure zero nutrients, maybe the better course of action is to set condition dog zebra by shutting off the lights and consider running UV. Water changes in these conditions only make it worse because it further destabilizes the system. Dinos are caused by nutrient instability, reefer impatience, and either an immature or disturbed biological filtration. The more of these you have, combined with strong light, and you get dinoflagellates. Even if you don't fully agree with my theory, you have to believe that the way we think about dinoflagellates is severely flawed. We've been battling dinoflagellates for years and have made little progress on how to prevent them. It's time to think differently. You can talk to a lot of experienced reefers and they'll often tell you that when things look great in their tank, that's when they are especially paranoid. It's like what sometimes happens before mass bleaching events in the ocean. You'll see these beautiful, bright colored, fluorescing pastel colors, and then almost overnight, boom, widespread bleaching. It's important to realize that if there is some potential badness brewing in your system, you are not going to know about it for weeks or even months. And since you don't know about it, you can't do anything about it. This is why it's important to do water changes regularly. It's a preventive measure. They are a way of mitigating potential badness through dilution. And this is also why dips and magical treatments often don't work. It's because usually what's done is done. It's pointless and even detrimental to freak out. The best, and often cheapest, course of action is to do water changes, remove unnecessary supplements, and get your tank back to simplicity. The benefit of water changes is less about replenishing some trace elements. It's more about mitigating potential unknown badness brewing in the system. The reality is that the easy part of reefing is knowing things like where to keep your parameters and that you need to keep them stable, to know how much lighting you need and what size skimmer you should get. That's easy. The hard part of reefing is being patient, resisting impulses, being proactive instead of reactive, and properly analyzing problems. Once you recognize and accept that our tanks have this delayed visual manifestation, you will not only become a better coral diagnostician, you will have a more pleasurable reefing experience, have long-term success, and achieve the reef tank of your dreams. Just like